we recognize that there's enmity. Um, Genesis 3.15, I, I deal with this in a whole series of videos in the section on unclean spirits, but there's an enmity between the devil and his demons and, and us as the children of God. And there isn't any enmity between the children of God and angels. They actually minister to us and God sends them according to his good pleasure to help us and, and, and strengthen us and so on. Um, so uh, why would the devil want to possess a person or influence a person? Why does he care? Like surely like some big powerful spirit, like surely don't they have better things to do than to mess with humans? Like why do they care? And so I'm reading here from this footnote on Matthew 12, 43 through 45. Again, it's in the 900s. It's in Section three in the the last chapter, um, all references to spirit, excluding uh, explicit and inferred references to the Holy Spirit. In other words, these are verses that have spirit, but they're not the Holy Spirit. Um, and so I'm just going to, I'm not, I'm not going to read it word for word, but I'm just going to go through. Um, I'm probably going to talk about authority in another video, but the first point I make is that we, we have authority. The second point is, and this is probably the one I'm going to read, the devil, the devil wants to be God, okay? Uh, he, he sees God, um, he sees his beauty, he sees his power, uh, he sees how people worship him, and the devil wants that. Uh, Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, uh, How thou art fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning! How thou art down to the, cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Again, a reference to angels. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Um, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. And then down third, um, Ezekiel... 28, 14 through 15, again, gives us a little bit more reference into the, or understanding into the, insight into the mind of the devil, as it were. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. And so, Satan was probably the most beautiful and perhaps even the most powerful of all angels, but he saw God and God utterly outshined him. God was worshipped and exalted by angels and humans alike. And Satan was like, oh, that is a good gig. Like, I like that. Remember um, one of the temptations that Satan gave to Jesus? If you will worship me, I will give you this. And how, how actually is he able to make that promise? Because Satan, Satan it does not own the world, as I make in the first point of this footnote. The world was given to the sons of men. Be fruitful and multiply, right? I've given you the fowls of the air and the fish of the sea and all this. And, and he reiterated that after the fall to Noah. And then we also see that in Psalm chapter 8. And so the, the, the authority that God gave to mankind didn't change. The fall didn't change that, right? But because man placed his faith in Satan instead of in the word of Satan, instead of in the word of God, Satan gained powerful and mighty sway through the fallen spirit, the dead, the spirit that is dead to God in man. He gained powerful sway in the hearts of men so that he, he himself doesn't own the earth, strictly speaking. But he operates in the hearts of men who do have authority on the earth. And so we see it as a kind of de facto power. And so then we ask the question, okay, Satan, and I, and I make the point in this footnote, which I don't have time to say here, but Satan doesn't have any power. Satan's a created finite being. He doesn't have any power to attack God. God is infinite and boundless. Satan has a fixed point of creation, and he's only a cherub. It's just, it's just like a person, in a sense. It might be bigger than a person, but it occupies a finite space. He can't, he can't even approach God. Like, he can't... The God is in front of him and behind him and on the side of him and on the other side of him and above him and below him. And like he can't, how can you overcome something like that? And the answer is you can't, obviously. Um, this, um, the psalmist writes in Psalm 139, if I, if I make my bed in hell, you are there. Um, where can I get away from your spirit? 
And the answer is nowhere because God is omnipresent and he fills everything. He's all powerful. And so anyway, Satan can't attack God. That's my point. It's not, he can't, he doesn't even know the first step. He can't do it. But he can attack what God has set his sights on, which is man who's made in his image and bears his likeness, right? And so I think that, and there's nowhere in the Bible that explicitly says this. This is just my intuition. Say, because man is made in the image of God, you remember that in Ezekiel, the throne room encounter in Ezekiel, there's one on the throne like a man. And you see he, he has legs and he has hands and he has a head, right? Like a man. I think that when Satan looks at us humans, he just looks at us and just for just a fraction of a second, he's like, oh, is that God? And I'm not saying we're, we're God. We're not God. We're evil. We're fallen. But we are made in the image of God and we are made in his similitude and his likeness. And my point is, Jesus has a body, the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and Satan looks and he sees this form and just like for just a second, is that Jesus? Like, is that God? And of course, the answer is no, we're not Jesus. Jesus is Jesus. We're not. But he sees that and, and I think it annoys him. He wants to overcome God. He wants to take over his throne. And so whenever he's surrounded by us, whom God loves and whom he hates, and, and we remind him of God, that annoys him. And he's just like, I, I want to get rid of these people. I want to attack them. I want to destroy them, okay? And so I'm just trying to give a little bit of insight into why Satan does what he does. Um, possession coming upon, what does it mean? What does it mean to possess or come upon? Um, I probably don't have time to read this verse, Mark 5, 2 through 13, but it's the story of the demoniac, this man who is said to be possessed by a devil, and then that devil is later identified as a legion, which is thousands of demons, okay? Then the demons ask to come out of, or Jesus tells them to come out of the man and gives them leave to go into pigs, so they basically inhabit pigs instead of the man. Um, but then also we see... Um, the the terminology that the Bible uses for possession, like we have a tendency to think like, oh, if you're possessed, the demon just locks you down and it just fills you up and it just utterly controls you. And maybe, but some, there's some evidence that maybe maybe the spirits come and go a little bit more than just staying in there, okay? And um, and you know, a reference to that is Matthew twelve forty three through forty five, when an unclean spirit has gone out of a man, and so on. The spirit leaves for whatever reason, and then eventually it comes back. It finds the house swept and empty. No Holy Spirit is there to occupy the space. And so he brings back seven of his buddies that are more wicked, right? Um, it came to pass that when, this is First Sam, Samuel 16, 23, and it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, David took a harp and played with his hand. He's worshiping God. And so Saul was refreshed, refreshed and well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Um, so we see, we see de demons possessing people, taking powerful control over them and, and overcoming them. In this case, this, the spirit that came upon Saul, it filled him with rage. It filled him with madness and ranting such that he threw, um, spears at David to try and kill him. But then the spirit also left, right? And so it kind of, it was more fluid than just like utterly possessed you and controls you at all times, right? That, that wasn't exactly what happened. Um, and my point in, in saying all this is that uh, it is never said one time in scriptures that angels possess people or come upon people. Ha however, we are, and there's a chapter in the book on um, the Holy Spirit with, upon, and in. The Holy Spirit does indwell people. The angels are with people, but angels are never said to come upon a person like as though you're putting on like a robe or a coat or something like that. And it's never said that angels possess people, but it is said that God indwells people sealed by the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, right? He lives in our hearts. And it's also said that the Holy Spirit comes upon people. Think Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And so God we see God indwelling and coming upon people. We see angels never, ever doing that. They are only with people. And then we see demons 
which are in rebellion to God, coming upon people and possessing people and also presumably being with people too. And so what I see is a picture of rebellion that's going on here, right? Um, these angels, these demons are um, reserved for judgment. Jude 1, 6, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. It's possible this is referring to a specific category of angels, but we do know that angels are not locked up in hell somewhere because we know that there's a spirit of infirmity that in, that took the, the daughter of Abraham. We know that there's spirits of of lying that go in in, uh, in error, which inspire prophets. We know that the devil in in uh, Job, where did you come from? Roaming to and fro throughout the earth and walking up and down on it. Does that sound like somebody who's chained down and locked down? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, the spirit of divination and acts, like there's all kinds of the spirit of antichrist, which is working already, like demons there may be some it's possible that there's a category of demons that's locked down somewhere but all demons ultimately are reserved for judgment and um god has utter sovereignty and utter control over them um the last uh two points that i want to make um demons are at war with angels I already read the scripture out of Revelation chapter 12, and so I'm not going to read it again. You can also read Daniel chapter 10, and you get the same sense. The prince of the kingdom of Persia um, and Michael, one of the chief princes, they're talking about angels there. They're not talking about men. Uh, and then the last point that I want to make is that um, God gives, and I, ha I think I have another video on this, um, because God is using the circumstance of the enmity between us and demons and us having a measure of authority over demons because we're fighting. We're learning how to overcome. We're learning how to put on our armor and stand our ground. James 4, 7, humble yourself before God or submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Right? We God is using the enmity and the fact that he has given us a measure of authority over the demons to teach us and train us and prepare us and sanctify us. Right, But there is no such relationship between man and angels because angels are in um, obedience to God. They're called holy angels. right? They obey God. And so because of that, there's no purpose for us to have authority over angels, especially because we still have a fallen sin nature and angels are obedient to God. There's another video where I talk about that. And so um, another difference between angels and demons is that humans have a measure of authority over demons, but humans do not have any authority over angels. Angels only terrify humans. And that's the uniform biblical account of the matter. So these are just some considerations of differences between uh, angelic and demonic unclean spirits.